yes, calories matter. And I think it should be leveraged. It should be some step in a weight loss journey to help shrink the size of the fat cell, not the number of fat cells. That is a different matter entirely, but it shrinks the size of the fat cell. Yes, energy must somehow be accounted for or reduced, but it shouldn't be the first step. This fat shrinking journey should start by addressing hormones first, in my view, because obesity or, or fat cell manipulation <clears throat> is really a matter of two, two variables, the caloric variable, which is the only one most people look at, and then the endocrine or hormone variable. We know that animals will store or expend energy based very heavily, almost exclusively on the way on the the hormone levels and there are many hormones that play into this including adrenaline um something you know a race car driver would know a lot about uh, hormones like cortisol you know the most famous stress hormone both of those are actually stress hormones but also sure the sex, over, sex I'm hormones. sure i overworked those yeah 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 that's right and and you're doing fine so you've you've made it work really well but um, you know, sex hormones, you know, uh, progesterone will have a different effect from estradiol, from testosterone. But then kind of sitting on top of all of these is the hormone insulin. It isn't, it isn't um, too bold of me to say it is impossible in a human body for a fat cell to shrink if, if insulin is elevated. Insulin is a hormone that will promote energy storage. It wants to, that's kind of the thematic effect of insulin from top to bottom. It will promote energy storage. Uh, a, an interesting example of just how profound this is, is looking at someone who has type one diabetes. Of course, in type one diabetes, a person isn't making any insulin. And if they are underdosing insulin or aren't on insulin yet, they will be eating thousands of calories a day thousands and yet they are wasting away getting thinner and thinner and thinner because they can't there is no potential to store energy on that body because there's no insulin to tell the body how to store the energy so that's basically what insulin's doing that in fact this will be the perfect example across the hallway from my office here is my laboratory the metabolism lab on my campus we grow fat cells. We are literally growing fat cells in little Petri dishes right now in the lab. And we will have these fat cells swimming in a little bath of, of calories. There will be glucose in this. There will be fatty acids in this culture medium, in this bath. And yet the fat cells will stay small and skinny, if you will. And it's not until we start putting insulin into the bath of these cells that they now know what to do with the energy that's all around them. Cells don't know what to do with energy unless they're told, and it's hormones, many hormones, insulin is paramount, that tells the cells what to do with energy. Now, some people have heard me say this and say, well, Ben's trying to deny thermodynamics. Not at all. My PhD is bioenergetics. I have an acute appreciation for energy in cells and organisms, but a cell must be told what to do with the energy that it has, and insulin does that. So to answer your question after this long-winded explanation, Great. the first step in my mind should be altering the foods you eat in such a way that you don't have to go hungry, you are nourished, you're eating when you want to eat, but you are lowering your insulin. By lowering insulin, you will start you will accelerate your metabolic rate. We've published papers on that. Others have for decades. We know that happens. Low insulin increases metabolic rate, so you're expending energy better, and you will start burning fat much higher because when insulin comes down, fat burning will turn on at a much higher rate. And so now you are learning to use your own fat for fuel. You're, you, you know, that's what fat cells are. It's like we're walking around with these energy bars strapped onto our bodies. Now we're finally opening them and using them, um, but only when insulin is low. So the first step, don't work against hunger. Just eat what you when you need to eat, but focus on foods that will help your insulin come down, which is basically, in fact, I know you've had people on the podcast previously that have touched on this in more detail, but it's my rules are control carbohydrates to help your insulin come down. Don't get your carbohydrates from a bag or a box with a barcode, whole fruits and vegetables, dynamite. But then the next two rules are absolute musts because while you are controlling and generally eating fewer carbohydrates, you don't want to be hungry all the time. So focus on protein and fat, which will have very minimal, if any, impact on your insulin. So that's the first step. Help lower your insulin. And then once you've gotten to a plateau, 
if those fat cells aren't quite as small as you want them to be, now you take the next step, which is now I'm going to start controlling energy coming in. And that is best, in my view, when done simply through the lens of intermittent fasting. And there are many, many ways to do that. But start with the low insulin step, then the lower calorie approach. Mm, mm, that was very cohesive, clear, and articulate. Well done. Um, okay, one question real quick. I feel like maybe this is a could be a myth, but can we get rid of fat cells or can we only shrink them and grow them? Yeah. Oh, I'm thrilled you're asking this. Yeah. So in the average person, and, and there are exceptions to this, but but the overwhelming majority of people will fall into how I'm just going to explain it. We will start making new and more and more fat cells throughout infancy, childhood, and, and adolescence, puberty. Then when we come out of puberty, the number of fat cells we have is typically set. So this is going to be late teens in a girl, and then, you know, roughly 20, maybe even early 20s in some guys. You know, if a guy is still... Yeah, well, so so it's flatlined. That was a joke. Yeah, I know. Yeah, so it's flatlined until from around 20 until we get to about 60 to 65. Okay. And then it starts to come down, which oh. is interesting, but that doesn't mean fat mass is coming down. This is fat cell number. Got and it. so we would look at this kind of drop and say, oh, well, then we should be getting lean as we get old. But depending on how the person is living, what they're eating and how active they are, um, what that means is the remaining fat cells went from this big to this big because they now have to carry a larger part of the, the metabolic burden because there are fewer of them around. Mm -hmm. And that is when problems start. And paradoxically, um, fat mass itself isn't the best indicator of how metabolically sound a person is going to be. Are they going to have mm -hmm. prediabetes or hypertension or infertility or early stage Alzheimer's? All of those are very related to metabolic health, but it's really how you're storing your fat. If you have fewer cells, but they're all really hypertrophied, a hypertrophic fat cell, that is very pathogenic. It's very uh, pro-inflammatory. They're secreting mm -hmm. pro-inflammatory proteins and they become very insulin resistant, which starts to spread insulin resistance throughout the body. Or on the other hand, you have people, a small sliver of people who can just keep making more and more fat cells and they all stay kind of nice and mm -hmm. small and happy and metabolically healthy, but they just have a lot more of them. Well, it's not the number of the fat cells that's problematic. It is the size. Uh -huh. And this has been borne out through decades of incredibly well-done studies around the world. A lot of the pioneering work was in Scandinavia. We've had a lot of wonderful scientists here in the US that have confirmed these findings again and again over the years. So it's not fat cell number, it's fat cell size. And that's what, as I noted, that's where most people, that's how most people get fat, um, where, where they, they get to adulthood, they stop growing the number of fat cells, then any further fat growth on the body is the hypertrophy of the remaining fat cells. And so you'd ask, do we ever lose them? Fat cells have a, a lifespan of about 10 years. And so in the average person, every 10 years, a fat cell dies, but up until the age of you know, 60, 65, it'll just get replaced by a new fat cell. And then it's at that age, you know, in the 60s, where the, as the fat cells start to die off, they don't get replaced in a kind of one-to-one -one ratio. Got it. Okay. So that theory is not a theory or that, uh, that is not a myth. That is true. Um, all right. Let's get back to insulin. I know this is like very much an area of your expertise and your research. Um, so I get a little confused. Okay. So I believe to, that this topic is challenging to comprehend to some degree because the metrics seem opposite. Like you want to be insulin sensitive, which sounds bad, but yeah, it's actually yeah. really good. So like there's a little counterintuitiveness to it. So maybe try and sort of run through the basics of how it works, how insulin works and the role it plays and then I'm going to hammer down on some questions and curiosities mm -hmm. around it. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so insulin resistance is my kind of one singular um, research focus among, among several that we have always going on in the lab. But that is the one thing I focus on the most. To understand insulin resistance and why we use that term to describe the problem, and it is a problem, Danica. I mean, as much as we want to say, oh, well, everything in the U.S., we're so fat and lazy and we're the worst, not at all. 
I've given talks about insulin resistance literally around the world. And when it comes to the top 10 countries with the most people with prediabetes or insulin resistance per capita, we're not even in the top 10. Mm. So this is a global problem. Now, what is insulin resistance? I think it's best described as imagining it as a coin. So I'm holding this coin called insulin resistance, and it has two sides. On one side is the phenomenon of insulin resistance explicitly, which is that the hormone insulin isn't working properly at all cells of the body. Now, I state it that way carefully because while some cells aren't responding very well to insulin, some cells are responding perfectly well. But globally, we call that insulin resistance. So insulin isn't working normally. That might be the best way to explain the insulin resistance side of the coin. But then we flip the coin over and it is always on the other side. You don't have one without the other in this case. The other side of this is hyperinsulinemia, which is just a clever way of saying that blood insulin levels are elevated. Now to understand, there's a kind of a perfect example of this, to understand how insulin resistance, both sides of this, the two aspects of it, is so problematic, we can look at the examples of infertility. And in women, the most common form of infertility is a condition called polycystic ovary syndrome, PCOS. Mm -hmm. In men, the most common form of infertility is erectile dysfunction. Now, but each of them represents one of the side of the coins. In the female with PCOS, that is the problem of the hyperinsulinemia. But she mm -hmm. has insulin resistance because they always come together these two sides of the coin. But in her, it's not the insulin resistance per se that's the problem, but her chronically elevated insulin that always is with insulin resistance. And when insulin is elevated, one of its, not only does it tell cells what to do with energy, but it also controls the production of sex hormones. Insulin has its hand in everything. And it's a little known fact that all estrogens were once testosterone. And then the ovaries or the testes in the women or, or men and men respectively, it will take the testosterone and convert it into the estrogens through an enzyme called aromatase. Now, ovaries naturally do it much higher than, than testes do, which is why women have relatively much higher estrogen levels than men do. But okay. insulin will inhibit that enzyme. And so if insulin is high, now her ovaries are taking all this testosterone, hoping to convert it into this much estrogen, but it doesn't happen because insulin is slowing down the reaction. So she ends up with too few estrogens to go through a normal ovulatory cycle and too many androgens or too much testosterone, giving her perhaps some acne or some coarser body hair, which is all mm. a result of the higher testosterone. Now, again, that was in the woman, which was the problem of the hyperinsulinemia side of the coin of insulin resistance. But in men, it is the insulin resistance part of it, where one of insulin's additional effects is to help blood vessels know when to dilate or expand to improve uh -huh. blood flow, wherever it may be. Of course, in the case of erectile dysfunction, that's obvious. But when the blood vessels become resistant to insulin's vasodilatory effects, uh -huh. when the blood vessel should dilate, it stays constricted, and thus erectile dysfunction is a result. Mm -hmm.